Okay, thank you. Uh, is this on? Yes. Yes, sir. So, thank you for, for the invitation and the opportunity to, to talk uh, about uh, climate issues and business opportunities. Um, <coughs> I, I would like this to be an interactive session, so if you have comments or questions, uh, uh, please uh, raise them. Uh, as soon as you're starting to think about them. Um, as um, was said in the introduction, I work uh, for 2050 Consulting as a consultancy. Um, uh, I will say a few words about that in a minute, but I spend also quite some time, half time more or less, at the Royal Institute of Technology doing research on environmental decision making, uh, science policy interactions. So I have this business side in the consultancy, I have research and also work for the civil society for the environmental organizations. Um, but I, I'm the same person, actually. <laughs> so among the sustainable development goals, uh, I will focus a bit more on, on climate, climate change. And uh, I'm not going to give you a recipe on how to uh, turn the threat into possibilities, because that's often contextual, but I will try to give a a background for that, uh, talk about some trends, uh, threats, opportunities, what, what, what's happening, uh, what, what I see, and link this partly to, to food issues uh, and agriculture to, to some extent, uh, which is also linking all this to, to health. But 2050, what are we doing? Well, actually we talk about good business uh, and earth imbalance as, as two starting points for, for the activities we we do in the consultancy. Uh, more specifically, we work on green business uh, development. We do analysis of climate issues, environmental issues, uh, reports, reporting, uh, in-depth analysis, and we work on uh, PR issues and communication. Uh, we give courses uh, or educational activities. So this is in the intersection between uh, the business sphere, politics, uh, and, and research and maybe civil society as well, if, if you want. Uh, so uh, this means that we work with companies, uh, public authorities, non-governmental organizations uh, in, in a number of uh, different, different projects where we sometimes work as external <coughs> consultants but increasingly often also take part in a kind of uh, advocacy type of activity where we, together with partners, uh, present solutions uh, on environmental problems on, on the public stage as, as well. And um, one of my colleagues is here in the back of the room, Lina. We are also located not only in Stockholm, but here in Malmö and in Linköping as, as well. And uh, we're looking for more uh, partners, so all those of you who have share the understanding with us that, that what's good for the planet is also good for, for good companies, uh, please contact us and, and help us in, in moving fast forward to sustainable development. 2050, by the way, of course, that's the year when not the Swedish, but the global uh, carbon emissions need to approach uh, a zero level in order to uh, give us a good chance uh, to reach the climate target well below 2 degrees, or even if we go uh, further uh, in ambition in, in climate targets, 1.5 degrees, we need to decrease the emissions rapidly. And I think it's possible. I can challenge you and, and uh, ask you to talk about an environmental problem and present a solution to another thing. There are technical, economic, or resource-related uh, bottlenecks that are so severe uh, or so small so that we can't cope with. Uh, it has to do with uh, market, public policy, and what we do in, in, in companies as individuals. Of course, we can, we can fix this. A better world is, is fully uh, possible. Um, and having said that, it's important, of course, also to, to underline that it, it's, not, it, it's not a walk in the park, uh, if, if, if you want. So it, it, what we're doing with the planet as mankind, is really extreme. We're shuffling around more, a larger quantity of physical material than, than the flow of the continents. Uh, we're exterminating uh, 
jeopardizing species faster than, than ever in, in, in the course of evolution, but changing the composition of atmosphere rapidly as well. And these are the levels of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere uh, nearly half a million years back. Uh, this is the most recent glaciation period. And you see that like the 50 levels of where we are today, and the emissions are still, still increasing. <coughs> Uh, and even staying on the same uh, level of emissions, that there are some signs that they might flatten off or even go down globally a bit, but continue to pump out the same uh, volume of uh, carbon dioxide or, or, other, or other greenhouse uh, gases will of course continue to, to warm the climate. Uh, so we need to go down uh, quite quite a lot. Um, so this is extreme. We're moving outside of, let's say, the geological <coughs> period where where mankind uh, started agriculture <coughs> and culture and civilization. Uh, we've been experiences as modern humans, plus minus one degree global average temperature. Uh, and we're moving outside of, of, of that now. That's why some scientists talk about the new era, Anthropocene, uh, the, the, the period of, of man. So it's a big challenge, of, of course, and um, these are updated daily or annually. This warming is, of course, not evenly distributed uh, around the globe. Uh, you see that the average temperature increase is, is higher, for instance, in the, in the Arctic area, and this is not updated, but these are from yesterday, figures on the Ar Arctic sea ice extent. Uh, <coughs> the blue is from December 2016 up to yesterday, uh, well, two days ago. <laughs> two days ago, yeah, it was updated. Yeah. And you see, it, we're uh, more than two standard deviations uh, below uh, the average uh, from, from the 1980s to 2010. Of course, if it's getting warmer, ice will melt, and molecules will also expand and move faster, which means that, that um, volumes of water will increase, and that's why we talk about sea level rise. So when I gave environmental education in, in Hergenes municipality uh, for all those being employed in the municipality uh, last fall, uh, I could show maps over what was happening. Uh, what's happening today and, and how the scenarios and prognosis looks like in the future, uh, where there will be a, a severe impact even here, uh, even though the situation is of course worse in the, in the Maldives and other, uh, other countries that will disappear in the future. Uh, when it's getting more wet or where we have more waters in some areas, including rainfall in Sweden. I think it's raining sufficiently already, but rainfall will increase 20 30 percent uh, during this century. Uh, the, the worst problem, probably, with uh, uh, global warming is that uh, the lack of water, water scarcity, the increase around the world. Uh, being an agronomist, basically, I know very well that what's limiting food production in the world. Uh, it, it's not temperature or CO2 levels, it's, it's water. Not in our country, but in, in most areas globally. And we experience, according to an article in Science about a year ago, half of the population, more than half of the population in the world experience water scarcity at least one month a year. 0 0.5 billion persons experience severe water scarcity 12 months a year. This will worse, will have le less water uh, for our um, to meet our human demands directly uh, for consumption and other uses and, and indirectly in agriculture. Uh, so that's, that's a big problem. Uh, most often these countries are uh, countries where people live in poverty, where people already are undernourished uh, or mal malnourished, which means that you have an energy nutrient intake per day than what's needed to feel fine when you're resting. Most of them are working a lot, fetching water, fetching firewood, etc. 
So um, it's a big challenge. Um, the, the scientific consensus is, is very high, and there are few areas of scientific uh, enterprise uh, in, in, in any discipline where scientists have put so much effort in, into investigating a, a problem uh, as we have done here in, in the area of climate change. There are studies of studies, so 98.5% of everything that's published related to climate that supports the intergovernmental panel on climate change. 1% uh, is saying more or less that while they are not showing a full picture, uh, underestimating the problem, that a few uh, scientifically published studies are questioning this, mostly by researchers who are not studying climate science themselves. Still, we know what's happening in, in, in Trump's US, or, well, it's not his US, but where uh, his view uh, is it, very strange, and the head of the EPA is, is a science denier. De de denying climate change is like denying the Holocaust. It has no scientific factual backing. And they use more or less the same strategies. You see the same, the same hallmarks of denial uh, in, in, in this area, as we've seen uh, throughout history, in, in other areas as, as well, they attack scientists and question their their, their, their aims and purposes, etc. Uh, they sheer pick results, and um, uh, I think I wrote an article in Svenska a while ago about this. I think it will be very difficult for Trump to to uh, uh, have a very negative impact on the global level. Because the geopolitical tensions that more or less were always manifested and were symbolizing the climate treaty negotiations were dissolved in Paris. It's not any longer uh, the type of game that China is saying, well, we're going to do this if you do it in the US and you in the EU. Uh, it's in the interest of nations themselves to combat climate change. To some extent, because we have the same uh, sources behind air pollution problems as we have with climate change, uh, the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, and that's why we see now uh, China and the EU and even India that, that is more reluctant to, to jump on the climate train in the big conference in Paris one and a half year ago, uh, saying that we're going to do this anyway. And we hear mayors and governors in, in, in both democratic and republican states in the USA, we're going to do this anyway. The companies are saying, well, trying to do that, we're going to continue. So it's difficult. And even though a, a couple of days back his, his decisions uh, started to come on, on, on climate issues, they were not so negative as was expected. It's rather investigate uh, the, the, the carbon power plant, etc., rather than to dismantle it immediately. So uh, the, the resistance, the opposition is, is strong, uh, also among the, the broader public. And I think the public view was manifested well in this climate summit in, in, in Paris, which was set up in a very intelligent way, so the heads of states and government started to say what they thought about environment and economy, competitiveness and, and mitigating climate change. And more or less all of them said that, well, environment and economy can go hand in hand. So they set the stage for the negotiators, uh, a very positive atmosphere uh, for the negotiations compared to with, where is it, Copenhagen, <laughs> uh, a few years back, when, when the politicians gathered after the negotiator had failed. And, and had sort of very, very limited time to, to deal with the controversies. And um, one year later, this was followed up in Marrakesh. Of course, you can criticize this treaty as, as being a treaty of contributions and not commitments. It's, 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 it's uh, not so strict. But countries are on board and, and move ahead. And you mentioned the World Economic Forum. This global risk report based on interviews with, with uh, political leaders, researchers, business leaders, NGOs, etc., uh, is looking at the likelihood and the impact 
which means the risk for, for different types of events. And, and for some reason, the big risks on the, on, 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 in, in the world change from one year to another. I don't think that's the case with the CO2 levels and things like that. But of course, it, 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 it mirrors a bit uh, the debate, etc. about failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation, water crisis, energy price shocks, biodiversity loss, food crisis are within the circles. If you take the 2017 report, some issues change a bit. I think the, the weapons of mass destruction, which is of course a severe impact, but more likely has changed a bit. Migration is going up and down. Uh, so, but the big pack, pa pattern is that, well, leaders of societies, leaders of business, realize we need to do something, which is a big change compared to 10 years ago or 25 years ago when I started with these issues that environment and economy are, are not compatible at all. We need to destroy the environment to, to, to get some movement in the economy. I was thinking by then. And we talk about stranded assets, and if you follow the Swedish debate, you know that it's not so popular to own a, a coal mine or even be a politician saying that you are going to sell them if you fail. But this is about stranded assets in agriculture, even. We have long term risks, short term risks, slow moving, fast moving risks. So sitting on the wrong system is really challenging and problematic today. You can lose your market. We have a discussion in Sweden on on a, a, a residue from palm oil, which is used in biofuels, that, that's now going to be phased out, more or less, according to, to the government. So, producing that, selling that, or buying that, is risky. Which is leading companies to come to us and others who will try to, to help and find solutions and way uh, out from this. And of course, we can try to foresee uh, these challenges uh, to do today much better than, than in the past. What's the recipe then from the side of politics? Well, Angel Guria, who is leading uh, the School for Finance Ministers, called OECD, is saying clear long-term signal that the price of emissions will only go one way up would be the best path to put us in a trajectory towards. And, and notice, this is not Greenpeace. It's the head of OECD who talks about zero emissions. Not the usual uh, balance between marginal costs and marginal benefits in, 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 in a diagram in economics or something. The optimum is zero. It's not even saying close to zero, which the environmental organizations and researchers are saying. This was in 2013, so it's not, it's not an influence based on the, on the political support from, from the Paris Agreement. This is based on analysis. This is based on facts. This is based on experience. Money talks, in a way. We don't want to put up a price on owning uh, fossil fuel resources, but on emissions. Like C CO2 taxation. Sweden was the first country with CO2 taxation, but since that came in the beginning of the 1990s, the, the average taxation on environment in Sweden has gone down compared to other countries, but it has, has, has gone up. Now that's changing uh, slowly again, it seems, in, in Sweden. Not an avalanche of proposals, but at least a set of new uh, proposals from, from the government on, on dealing with fossil fuels, uh, some supported by all democratic parties in the parliament, uh, some uh, negotiate. Is this something that's killing the economy? No. We know very well that politics can trigger and foster and drive innovation. This is an example from the area of chemicals policy where ephthalates, as they're called, DEHP is one of the most common um, uh, plasticizers is making plastic soft. So if you, if you have plastic printing on your t-shirt, you yeah, have plasticizers, okay. which is <laughs> additive, Sorry. which is disappearing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's usually the reproduction of men, so I'm during the course. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. Anyway, when the EU Commission started to talk about this, when expert committees came with recommendations to, to face it out, of course, 
companies use this. They innovate. They, they see new, uh, new market opportunities. And those who have the first solution are suddenly moving, supporting the politicians. Yeah, ban it, they say. And this is going more and more rapidly. And we know, again, we didn't know in the 1970s and 1980s that this could happen in the market, but we know it well now. We see it in more and more areas. So this doesn't mean that all companies push for stricter environmental regulations, but more and more companies are doing so. So the rules of the game uh, are, are changing. And more and more politicians realize this. It's, it's a positive uh, circle. What can we do in the area of climate change? Well, first of all, it's like a disease. Vaccine is the best. We don't need to be addicted to fossil fuels. I, this is a summary I made in 2001 at Karlstad University, where I was by then. Uh, and uh, I used to show it because it, 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 after five years later it wasn't really up to date. It's even more now, but already then uh, we talked about cars, 65-75%. Now we can, of course, if you have an electric car, you can go down much further, depending on how the electricity is produced in the car, etc. Buses can be much better. <coughs> if you have a biogas bus, you more than 100% compared to, to, to having the waste in giving uh, methane emissions in, in uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, in in uh, <laughs> deposits. Landfits. What? Landfits. Landfits. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, train, airplanes. Well, there is a hype now that biofuels can fix this, but emissions on high levels are, are generating twice as high car, uh, effect as greenhouse gases, so it's problematic. Uh, housing uh, is huge potential. So, uh, I want you to show it. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a point here. This picture, um, I, I took it from a good friend, Janis Potoshnik. He, he was uh, EU, uh, environment commissioner in the EU Commission. He's now leading the uh, International Resource Panel. We showed this a couple of years back, uh, compiled it together with others from various sources. H how much do we use the car? 1.6% we look for parking, 1% we sit in in, in in France it's parked 92% of the time, 5% uh, that's the amount of time that we're using, uh, using the car. And it has five seats on average, but carries 1.5 persons. Just imagine that in your house. Do you have five spare rooms <laughs> where people are not living? Not often. But the time-wise use is quite efficient compared to uh, the, the, the energy. What we're using to move people is the small, small bit on the top in orange. We lose a lot in the engine. We have more than a century old system to, to take us, the, the old motors. 86% of the fuel is never reaching the wheels. Then we have a lot of uh, losses in transmission and, 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 uh, and uh, resistance, etc. And we have a lot of deaths due to accidents. Not to talk about, in the European Union, 400,000 persons dying each year due to air pollution. 400,000 persons. 5,000 in Sweden due to particles. How many are dying due to road accidents? Less than a tenth. But a road accident, well, citizens get all picture deaths. Easy to visualize. You don't see people walking around with a particle in the head and just die. It's not happening. So, how much do we spend on, on, on road safety? rebuilding and, and believing that more roads will decrease the problem, which is not doing, uh, just increasing traffic. And how much do we spend on, on, on these particles? Nearly nothing. Don't even have a tax, as they have in Norway, on studded tires that give rise to a lot of particles that are killing people, actually, they die. Sometimes it's called in the debate, premature death, as is, if that's possible, death. <laughs> 
are cancer, well, it's a premature death. But particles are premature death, so they are less important. 400,000 persons every year. It's an enormous health problem, which we seldom talk about. And the funny thing is that if we combat climate change, we can deal with these air pollution problems as well. It's actually so that the 15 countries in the world that emit most greenhouse gases, they have air pollution-related health costs amounting to 4% of GDP. How much does it cost to mitigate climate change? Well, if you're a fast mover, you can do it to negative cost. If you switch off the lamp, you save money and climate at the same time. But 1, 2% of GDP. So, so it, it's really from just a health point of view, something, if, if you do the health thing with air quality, you pay for the entire time with fish project. So these co-benefits are uh, enormous. Well, on system level, you can also do a lot of things. But um, <coughs> let's look not only at the vaccine, but also we need some energy. We need medicine. Uh, and um, the renewables are increasing. 2015, this came just before the turn of the year here from the from, um, International Energy Agency. Renewables surpassed coal to become the largest source of global electricity capacity. And, and, I mean, the investments are huge. Greenpeace were a bit embarrassed when they presented their energy revolution scenario because the development of wind power was faster than their most optimistic scenario. <laughs> Between the finalization of the report and, and, and the press conference. That's the same with the International Energy Agency. I, can, I, I mean, I can continue for hours with diagrams and things like that. But, yeah. Even in the US. And this so-called president will not change this. I promise you. Because it's profitable. It's cheaper than fossil fuels. Why should they pay more to do something that's worse? Well, maybe he's doing it, but not the rest of us. And knowledge and attitudes uh, are changing in this area, even when it comes to not only traffic systems and things like that, but, but food. And another big important thing, would, because we know that meat production, this is the meat guide, just to translate it, meat guide from WWF, WWF saying half meat consumption, uh, more, more or less. We know that we have obesity, we have an overconsumption, uh, and again, this is a co-benefit, but overconsumption of meat from a climate point of view, some 15 to 20 percent, depending on how we count, of global greenhouse emissions coming from agriculture, but uh, food, uh, well, beef is, is the most problematic area. Uh, and we have obesity increase at the same time. So, again, we can solve health problems related to food at the same time as we, we cope with and mitigate climate change. And, and reports are coming up, changing climate, changing diets, same thing. So we will have a better health, uh, personally, individually, and decrease our climate footprint at the same time, the same measures. You don't need to go from 100% meat consumption to zero. Uh, you can have it. Just as we can go two in every car instead of one. If you do that, you have to cost but it cost me two, two, two and a half. The sharing economy, we know about it in, in, in the Arab hotels, with Airbnb, in, in, in the, the taxis, with Uber, and food sharing has come out. We can't share the same plate of food, of course. You can, first of all, you can eat a bit less, but you can also go home dining among your neighbors. And I guess this will come up as the same kind of threat to traditional restaurants as uh, Uber is the taxis and Airbnb is the hotels. And our social security, taxation, insurance, consumer safety, legislative systems are not ready for this. We have a public committee now presenting reports soon on how to deal with this. And you see the opposition. At the same time, we see entrepreneurs earning a lot. It's impossible to stop. How can you stop people co coordinating themselves with cell phones? 
that's what you're doing more or less. This is amazing way. I have full access to all knowledge in the history of mankind, two or three clicks in the cell phone. So I, I guess we haven't even seen the beginning of, of what this can do with societies. And risks can be turned into opportunities. Again, like the Global Risk Report, this Global Opportunity Report um, is a bit mirroring the debate, the, the, the specific year, because the opportunities are changing from one year to another, whereas the world is more or less the same. Uh, but um, 2016, the focus on loss of ocean biodiversity, we can close the loop, regenerate ocean economies, smart ocean. I mean, if, if, we've, if we're not overfishing, if you overfish, if you kill all the fish parents, you won't have any fish kids. They can be fish parents in the future. And biologists are really clever in calculating how many fish parents and fish kids we're having. And if you go down a bit in catch, the stock will increase, so the catch will be large in the future. It's like when I was a kid and was saving money in the bank, you know, it increased. Now you have to pay for doing it, but <laughs> <coughs> the oceans are still functioning in that way. So there's a potential. Um, uh, resistance to antibiotics, antibiotic-free food, etc. Transport, um, uh, the young generation, the global food crisis. Smart farming is coming up where, where, I mean, we're not controlling tractors with cell phones today, but things are changing rapidly with, with the, the fourth, uh, fourth generation of the internet, the internet of things, etc. Reduce food waste. If we complain of food prices, <clears throat> and and uh, environmental legislation, what? Stop throwing away one third of what you buy. Seems a bit logical. Uh, and <clears throat> the residues that will be there, like bones and skin, we can do, uh, use for producing biogas, substituting fossil fuels. The circular economy is, is emerging. And the resource framework focuses about on, on regenerate, share, optimize, lose, loop, virtualize, explore. Uh, numerous companies uh, come up, others transform. Uh, I have difficulties to see any organization, public or private, that's not having a huge potential to, to improve their performance from, from both economic and climate point of view. This is in Swedish, fortunately, the office industry. Um, <coughs> Increased climate ambitions among larger uh, com companies. Uh, this is about climate reporting uh, on listed companies, uh, stock, on, uh, stock market. Uh, companies are doing much more. We see that. Uh, they realize challenges, they take measures, they move. Uh, when we ask them, we have another report, when we ask them, do you see increased environmental taxation as a threat or as an opportunity. The majority is saying an opportunity. Researchers have of course looked into this. Finally, this is a, a summary of much of the research that um, Robert Eccles has done. We provide evidence that high sustainability companies, which is defined in a specific way, significantly outperform their counterparts over the long term, both in terms of stock market as well as accounting. Of course, not all that's the case, but increasingly often. And well, I've touched on some of the other challenges, but mostly focused now on, on, on the climate. Um, number 13, the climate action objective is sustainable development goals. The idea is that everybody on Earth should know about them. We have, uh, Dozens of indicators, I think 169 targets under indicators for this, but um, many organizations are now systematically uh, working with these 17 sustainable development goals in municipalities, municipal companies, in private companies, etc. Uh, it takes a day to go through your what, what, what you're doing, your activities, um, and, and make it sort of rapid scan, where can you contribute, where are you exposed, so to say, where, where can you help out in, in, in this uh, project. And, and the focus here is not that we 
only needs to help around in the world. But for instance, the life below water is just as much about the Baltic Sea as it is about uh, the coast outside of Senegal, where the fishing fleet of the EU is going, the kill all the fish pirates in Europe. Uh, so it's about both. And compared to the Millennium Development Goals, the focus for developing countries uh, situation, this is a common global ambition. And you could say that, well, we had a water conference in the 1970s, there's a water to everybody, we had targets in the 1970s, health to everybody, we had the Stockholm Declaration in 1972, Rio Declaration in 1992, Johannesburg Declaration in 2002, and Rio Plus 20 in 2012. Why do we need all these new targets, etc.? Well, because they give leverage to processes and increase commitments and increase awareness uh, among decision makers. And, and we're getting better and better. We know more and more about how to reach them. So uh, things are moving uh, in, in the right direction in, in, many of these, uh, in many of these areas. Just two final pictures which I have shown now and then over the years because I heard once that, well, you know, we need technologies, uh, we need knowledge, just apply that. Um, that's the, let's say, the, the male tradition, the engineer's tradition. And I, I'm at the, the, the University of Technology now, so I. I have these people around me all the time. Of course, we need new technology. Uh, we, we need to apply that. Uh, and we need to think logically. We can't think when solving the problem as we did when we created them. But basically, it's not about this. You can, you can find the recipes on the internet everywhere. Uh, people know about them. Uh, what this comes down to Basically, and I was once asked the question when Barossi was chair of the EU Commission, and I had a debate with him about the environment action program of the EU. I was asked by a reporter after, what would you put on his table if you knew that he was going to read it, sort of follow it? Was it the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change? It came in 2006, seven, 700 page, pages showing that GDP loss can be 20% with business as usual. If we move, uh, the costs will be plus 1% to minus 1%, and who is not willing to earn one crown to get rid of a bill of 20, everybody. So, no, it's not about that. Uh, as I've read this, Barnes give it a good, children writing to God, many years ago, and I took this copy. It's about empathy, it's about solidarity, it's about that kind of thinking, that we care, that we realize that <coughs> this planet, mankind, other species, is much more than uh, ourselves. So, dear God, I'm sending 25 further. Uh, we can't do that any longer. That you can give to a child that's poorer than mine. Uh, greetings from Marlin. So, I mean, <coughs> you can find all this technical, economic, natural scientific information in textbooks, in newspapers, in, in, on the internet, in scientific journals, etc. But this is something you cannot read about how to do feel it. So that's my only, um, well, that's the only thing I would like to recommend. I think as Molly uh, was doing, again, I don't know how old she is today. I'm waiting to meet her, but I haven't done that yet. So please do that. Thank you very much. There might be questions or comments. Exactly. No one? In Swedish, of course, also, if you want. Hi, my name is David Dekmore. I'm uh, one of the board members of Root Food, where we try to mitigate uh, food waste um, or create awareness through creating catering and providing food insecure groups with food. But one of the obstacles we're coming up against is organizations that are resisting providing um, the food waste. And for us to operate, sustainably we need to start charging to collect food waste so the proposition of the, the value proposition of actually reducing their normal waste reduce re, waste removal costs and the CSR benefits still doesn't get home with a lot of organizations how would you suggest approaching those organizations from a different angle
Well, <clears throat> I, I guess as you do, work the awareness raising that we need to change attitudes. We need to think about what, what is what, when is food wasted and not. And what, what is food waste and, and, and how long can you can you use specific type of food? So I guess that's one thing. And then we have you mentioned regulations that prevent it. But they well, we've, we've proposed yeah. the, the paying at a reduced cost because right now they're paying a seesaw or whoever to reduce to remove whatever food they throw away. Ah. We want to take it away before it reaches that stage and then provide value. We can create products that they can resell. Yeah. So there's a value proposition in terms of cost reduction, mm -hmm. uh, increased value on their shelves, etc. But it's still not getting past uh, the gatekeepers. Yeah. Why? That's, <laughs> that's what we're trying to figure out. So we're trying to figure out a, a different angle, how to present opportunity so that they can see it clearly. Because it's not boiled down to straight numbers, because we've shown them the numbers. And then the CSR benefit is also not you know, showing or, or, or hitting home as a value, an opportunity for their side. Even though we see it as, as an opportunity for them, mm. for everyone to actually be involved. But yeah, I, 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 I guess I'm not in a better position to, to come up with a solution than you are. But, but I mean, sometimes, sometimes we need to, to change things. And sometimes we need, let's say, natural science. The ice is melting, temperature is increasing, etc. Uh, for, for some target group, that's key. But I guess the, let's say, environmental researchers, environmental organizations, environmental politicians, we have won that. Some, some, some behave like speed bumps, like uh, Trump is doing, but just don't drive over too fast because you hit your head in the roof. Then, then you can continue. We have won that. We have problems. I, I think the challenge now is to to deal with the, uh, the, the the kind of opposition that says, yes, of course we have all these problems, but think about, and we have the technologies, but think about the elderly, the younger, those in rural areas, those in cities, everybody know what. So what's happening with companies? So the, the, the opposition in terms of economics, but I would say when it comes to economics, we, are winning that game as well. <coughs> the counter argument that this is bad from a competitiveness point of view, or a job development point of view, or for workers, or for, for individual finance, or even for rural areas, they're losing that. That's not just true. Then the next is the mental thing, uh, how people behave. And, and that's, I, I guess that's where, it, where you encounter problems, because people People tend to behave as they have been brought up and as they have been doing. They tend to look at specific things, in, in, in particular those that are close or are experienced to be close to the heart, like food is. But at the same time, I mean, the sociologist here in, in, in uh, Lund, Annalisa Nedin, has shown that, well, we change food habits all the time. It's not, people say, well, we will never change food habits. Well, we do. We're not eating like our parents, they're not eating like their parents. We're rather eating all over the spectrum now, so the attitudes are changing as well, but it takes a long time, and I, I don't know if that's where the, where the, the challenge is. Have to stick in Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a question I think is a bit easier for you to answer, and that's, uh, you showed a slide with a global opportunity report. Yeah. What report was that? I think it's, yeah. no. it's called Global Opportunity Report. And it's it, it's a it's a mixture of three four different organizations. I, I can give you give you the link or the information, but if, if you just, just search for it, you will find it. It's coming annually. The one last year is a bit more interesting. Oh, uh, two years than the last year. Well, I have a uh, maybe a final question. Time is running out. When I see this, I'm, I, I get quite optimistic, and I see a lot of companies that are actually in the in the loop now, do, yeah. uh, looking into these opportunities. I had this meeting with the Danish uh, uh, Federation of Industry the other day, and they, I was saying that because of the, the bridge summit is going to take place at, the, at their facilities in Copenhagen, and I told them that you should be a part of this, and they are looking. He was looking at me and saying, 
you know, my companies do not have anything to do with the global goals. And I'm like, oh. I don't think you have a market uh, there uh, in 10 years. Uh, but this is the reality for a lot of companies, and I think a lot of bigger companies are still in that, that seeing, and they don't want to be, or they don't think they, yep. how do we get them on board? Because I think a lot of the global ones need to get on board to get mm. this uh, going. Well, it, it's, I would say it depends on what, which branch and which, but generally my, my experience is that individual companies move easier and are more willing to take measures uh, than branch organizations. Uh, I, I was in this all party committee on environmental objectives, it's called in English, Miljömålsberedning, that presented this uh, a year ago, uh, the proposal on climate bill, which is now the parliament's table actually, and we decided in June, so that would be adopted. But Business Sweden, since then, the organization, was always sitting in the corner saying, how much does it cost? And of course that's a valid question, mm -hmm. but you need to ask yourself also, what does it cost if we're not doing it? Yes. And are there additional co-benefits as well, if we do it? So, and then we know that climate damage is more costly than the cost for mitigation. And we know that co-benefits are also larger then the mitigation cost is too zero to take it measures. But we have set up a political system where in the finance ministry you need to prove in a cost-benefit analysis that uh, the, 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 the taxation now, <coughs> bonus models on cars, uh, uh, taxation of uh, domestic and foreign flights, etc. You need to do cost-benefit analysis and, and prove this. And of course the costs are visible now to the extent we have them. And the benefits for the farmers in Bangladesh 50 years from now are very difficult to value in the market today. So we have, we're living in a, in, well, in, in, in a period where we realize these enormous threats, we see solutions, but we live with all the systems. So it's not only the thinking, it's also the, the system. Why, why can you do deduction of your taxes if you have a heavy car, but not a bicycle? So, I mean, we have subsidies to coal power. Of course, here, you get a million, open a mine, yes, burn it, yes, give you money. And then we do that, we're trying to tax you. And of course, that, that's a bit problematic. Uh, if, if, we have, if, if we invest like 45 to 60 billion Swedish crown in the road around Stockholm, that will, according to the road agency, increase emissions and increase congestion motivated by decreasing emissions and decreasing emissions. If we do that, of course, people will tend to drive more cars, and then it's difficult to ask them not to do it. Uh, so, and this goes in all areas. I, I've done a lot of research on chemicals policy to get rid of a substance that scientists prove is toxic, carcinogenic, or toxic to human reproduction. You need to do a risk assessment. It's like a cost-benefit analysis back in the area of chemistry and toxicology. To do that, you need data. But the legislation demanding this data and risk assessment is not asking for that data from the companies. So it's a catch-22. It's impossible. That's why it's taking 10, 15 years to get rid of substances. We know that are problematic, even if we have substitutes. Because for those producing bromine, brominated fairy toilets, it's of course something beneficial. So we're stuck in old systems and they, they, they take time to change. But I think this message that it's really more costly not to do it than to do it is, is, is getting gradually, we, we see gradually and gradually increasing awareness of politicians. And also that we have all these co benefits. But we're hardly not domesticating those. Not even in this all party committee on environmental objectives. Half of that final publication that came in June last year is about air pollution. But even though this committee consists of people that are supposed to know this more than anyone else, there is no linkage between climate action and, and air pollution action. And therefore, we, we, if we don't see the double benefits. And, and for that reason, there is a reluctance to, to take more action. Even though we know that we, we, we overperform. Um, just one example, <laughs> when there was something called the Kyoto Protocol, 
uh, the world was supposed to decrease 1997 in Kyoto, decrease emissions by 5%. EU was given a share to decrease emissions from 1990 to 2010, the average 2008 to 12, to decrease emissions by 8%. This was divided within the European Union, different ambitions for different states. Sweden, who had phased out oil in heating and housing, etc., uh, was given uh, possibility to increase by 4%. <laughs> Where decrease, we're supposed to, and the environment minister, uh, someone started by then said, no, maybe we're not going to do this. And we had a public um, committee saying, let's go for minus two. And business with it. You know, banana republic companies will, will move. In Vermland, when I come from, you can't go by car. It, you know, countryside will die. People will migrate. Like havoc. And Parliament said minus four. You can just imagine the reaction, like, like when we close Bashebeck, it would be dark in Sweden in February. <laughs> um, so it's a very deep pessimism on technological development and, and opportunities among companies to innovate and uh, the, the capacity for humans to change. So minus, minus four, Parliament. Where, where are we now? You know, I mean, who knows? I think it was minus 16 when we passed the deadline, now we're close to minus 20. How many companies, I've asked at least 10,000 persons, how many companies have left Sweden due to the CO2 tax? Do you know anyone? People go to China, well, they have to leave 1.3 billion persons, so it's big markets, so that's why they go to China. But do companies move due to CO2 taxes? No, not even business Sweden. They said in the beginning of the 19th century, just wait some years, then it will happen. But it's 27 years now. <laughs> so, we can fix it. And I promise you. And I do believe that what you pointed out right now is that this is what we try to do with the bridge, and, and hopefully are coming there, getting there eventually, to really get these t kind of topics on, on top of everyone's mind, even if you're a company or authority or politicians, because I think everyone has to... I mean, change their regulations or change their business ideas or whatever, and, and be get on board and understanding that this is not something uh, negative for anyone. So uh, finally, your best advice to us working with the rich and, and trying to uh, uh, make uh, uh, the talks and the, uh, and changes from our point of view. What what should we bring with us? Well, I, I think it's important to 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 never. I think it's important to, well, to, to, to turn around, to always talk about the challenges, uh, and, but, but to do it on, on, a, on a factual basis, on a science-based, uh, because I, I think you need to realize the global challenges as they are in order to be mobilized to, to deal with them, but just stopping there is, is, is counterproductive, so you should always also talk about uh, the, the solutions and the possibilities. It doesn't work for everybody all the time. There are huge challenges and systems and, and things like that. But, but most of it, that's my point. The, the challenges are not in the resource space. They are not in the energy source space. They are not in technology. They are not even in economics. They are in our systems that we can change and in our minds. And we can change them as well. It's happened before. It will happen again. We will fix it. Thank you so much for this and uh, these optimistic words. Thank you for coming. And uh, coming up.